sometimes the computer likes to do it without the computer. It's appropriate here. Since the uh, beginning of the laser, since the laser was first discovered in 1960, um, people learned how to make shorter and shorter pulses. And as a matter of fact, the progress was really dramatic over a number of years until about 1986 when progress ground to a halt. So in this time, it was really a Moore's Law-like progression which stopped until 1986 and recovered again this year or last year with the decrease of pulse durations by about a factor of two or three. And the change, the problem was, of course, we had to make a change in the physics as we approached the single period of the light duration. We had to make a change to the physics, and that change was to the change that we've heard about this afternoon, high-intensity recollision physics with atoms. Again, very much like you've heard about this afternoon. The holdup was not the basic idea of how to make out a second pulses. That was clear a decade ago. The holdup really was how do you measure what you've made. And that was just not clear, and it was only became clear in the last year or so. Now, I'm not going to talk about measurement, although I could. Um, so the physics that was behind it, just to review what you've heard before, the physics was behind it was that we'd bring a strong laser field in, we would pull an electron from an atom, the electron would go over a trajectory determined largely by the classical field, be driven back with some probability to the atom from which it left. It was often helium atoms, so I've illustrated a helium atom. And in the recollision with the atom itself, it would recombine, or it had some probability of recombining and giving out a photon. And so that recombination to the ground state, if you want to think of it that way, I would actually re-express it if we wanted to make this a talk on high harmonics and add a second pulses. But that recombination to the ground state led to high harmonic generation, which has been alluded to here. And it led to add a second pulses simply by controlling that trajectory so there was only one small time available for the recollision process. But you can imagine when you hear about the physics, when you hear about this, you can imagine this is not the most efficient process that you can imagine. As a matter of fact, after a lot of effort, the efficiency is brought up to about 10 to the minus 6, maybe slightly more, but not very much. And so of the laser light, you can convert approximately 10 to the minus 6 into a harmonic. Maybe the attosecond electrons, which had to be behind the attosecond physics, are as valuable as the photons themselves. And really, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the attosecond electrons, and I want to characterize them. I want to change your perspective from photons to electrons. There are a few view graphs that I don't have, which I would love to have because of the context of the talk on double ionization physics. But I will start out now and try to tell you how to look at the attosecond electrons how to calculate what there should be. But of course, that's clear we knew that. I mean, we know that essentially from uh, the other talks we've heard. But I want to review that for you, and then how we measure the current density. So if you think of the, uh, the atom, or whatever, a molecule or whatever, we had to free the electron. And the freeing of the electron was a matter of taking the electron and tunneling it out from the atom in the way that Lou described. As a matter of fact, this is a small. A, a poor sketch of what Lou showed. And you can imagine that when the electron tunnels out, it comes out as a burst when the field is large. And in fact, you can, to a reasonable degree of accuracy, think of this simply as tunneling. Go back to the problem set in Landau and Lischitz. Calculate, look at the tunneling rate. That's the equation for it. For a hydrogen-like atom or ion. And that's quite accurate for a hydrogen-like ion. And so that gives you the probability of ionization as a function of phase. So that tells you the probability of launching an electron at any given phase at any given time. We take that probability, establish initial conditions. That's the thing I would like to show you next, how establishing the initial conditions. So once the electron comes out, it comes out, well, it doesn't really have zero velocity, does it? Because quantum mechanics never allows such a thing. It has a range of initial velocities, which we can actually measure, which we can probe. 
and we can, we can understand what they are. And so using the ionization as a function of field that I showed you before and the initial conditions that we can probe experimentally, we can launch a swarm of classical trajectories and allow them to progress out and come back, and follow their interaction even with the ion, and calculate what the current density that the ion sees as a function of time. So that's what's behind the double ionization and things like that. What does it look like? From the point of view of the ion from which it left, it is as if I sent in a current from outside, the current density approaches 10 to the 11 amps per square centimeter. This calculated for titanium sapphire light um, at a modest intensity, but the current density is not so sensitive to that from the ion from which it left, we, given that the ion ionized. It approaches 10 to the 11 amps per square centimeter, and according to the calculation, it comes in bursts, the first burst being the first time the electron come back and recollide. As a matter of fact, that first burst, and trying to control it to one burst, is why we have attosecond pulses of duration, about 650 attoseconds. As a matter of fact, the duration of that burst is approximately one femtosecond, if you look at the full width half max. It's followed by subsequent bursts, or micro bunches, if I want to put it in electron language. Well, the electron can miss in the first time, but it interacts with the Coulomb potential and come in from the back. And that's the second one. It actually goes in the second direction. It can have missed twice, and that's the third one, and so on. And so it comes in a sequence of micro bunches separated by half a wavelength, uh, half a period in time. And so that's the calculation. Now I want to confirm it. Now we're in the state where we were with attosecond pulses a decade ago. Can I confirm it, and can I then use it? So I want to talk about measuring attosecond electron pulses. So it's appropriate I follow Ken, because we want to measure attosecond direct electron pulses by looking at hydrogen well, really, hydrogen double ionization. I'm placing it in a different context, but really what I'm going to do is look at hydrogen double ionization. So if I'm going to measure an add a second electron pulse, I need a clock against which to measure. And my clock is going to be a hydrogen molecule. Imagine what happens when I ionize a hydrogen molecule. I form all of a sudden H2 plus on its ground state. Actually, we can comment later on on what's the probability of it coming to the ground state and the excited state. And I'll show you later on that it's about 10 to the minus 4 or less that it will excite the excited state. I can actually tell you we've done experiments. We know it's less than 10 to the minus 6. So ionization forms H2 plus in the ground state. Of course, the natural internuclear separation of H2 plus is larger. And so therefore, we form a wave packet, a vibrational wave packet. Simultaneously, we really form two wave packets, a vibrational wave packet in the ground state of H2 plus, a nuclear motion, and also an electron wave packet, which I want to measure. And I can use one against which to measure the second. And so that's the basic idea. I want to use a vibrational wave packet as a molecular clock to clock the recollision physics. And then later on, if I have time, I will show you how to turn that problem around and use the electron wave packet to clock vibrational physics. So now I'm going to tell you how experimentally, because I'm going to give you experimental talk, how experimentally we do that measurement. So here's my hydrogen molecule sketched in the center. It's in the middle of a time of flight mass spectrometer, which simply means I have two two plates applying a field, a positive field, ground here, so that as soon as I ionize my molecule, it feels the force caused by the field and is pushed towards the microchannel plate out here. The, mic the, the um, plates on which I place the field, have one has a small hole in it, and so for the ion to reach the microchannel plate, it must pass through the small hole. So only those molecules that are shooting right towards the bullseye gets through, and any molecule that's offset cannot get through. In other words, by using a hole in a plate, we can control effectively the alignment of the molecule. We don't control the alignment of the molecule at all. We select those molecules that are aligned. 
by looking at the time of uh, the selection criteria depends on the energy with which we shoot, but we're going to be interested in rather energetic ions, and so our angle, our angle of re angular resolution is about eight degrees for high energy ions. And so that's the accuracy with which we can line molecules. Now, I'm free to bring my laser polarization, which comes in from out of the room into the board. I'm free to polarize it either in this direction, which I've sketched here, or in this direction, which I sketched there. Now, or in anything in between, as a matter of fact. I can do it at any angle at all. I'm going to concentrate almost completely on molecules aligned perpendicular to the laser field for reasons that I will say to you in a minute or two, because it simplifies the problem dramatically. And, but I'm free to choose as I wish, and only one place will I actually use all angles. I think it'll be clear when I get to it. And so the experiment then is, a clear, is an experiment measuring the kinetic energy of the fragments that come out through in the method that I think I've just described to you. Question. Yes? There's an implication that there isn't enough rotation Uh, yes, that is an implication. Um, I'm going to be I, I'm going to be interested in re really rather energetic dissociations, and so this is going to come apart in well, you'll see in a few femtoseconds. I'll show you time resolved measurements. So there's really not much time for for rotation. That's correct. That is an implication, and that is correct. Now, I don't have the full. I want to show you these kind of experiments and how they look then. So this is not raw data, but it's not so far from raw data. We take the laser light. We bring it in, as I've shown you. It's actually perpendicular. It's illustrated here if I had the molecule the other way, as if it's parallel, but it's actually rotated. The major axis is rotated perpendicular to the molecular axis. And we look at the number of ions against their kinetic energy. And so it's not quite raw data, because we measure time of flight as raw data. Um, we look at the number of ions as a function of their kinetic energy. And we do that for both linearly polarized light and for elliptically polarized light. As a matter of fact, we do it for many different ellipticities and look at, at the, um, this signal as a function of ellipticity. That's interesting. Um, because in linearly polarized light, the electron can come out and come back and recollide. In circularly polarized light, the electron comes out, comes back, and misses, and comes out here. And so there are no recollision processes. In fact, we know from many experiments done with these kind of, um, these kind of experiments that recollision is extremely sensitive to ellipticity. It only takes a small ellipticity to mo offset the electron and turn off the double ionization process. Therefore, we can, we can identify recollision processes by the ellipticity dependence. So here's what we see for the signal count with elliptically polarized light, 0 0.3 ellipticity. That's the ratio of one field to the other, 0 0.3. And here it is in linearly polarized light. And you can see the difference plotted here. And I'm going to concentrate from now on in that difference. So I'll go back and just review the experiment before I go further. Ionization takes H2, moves it to H2 plus forming correlated wave packets, an electron wave packet that comes off, and a vibrational wave packet that comes. When the electron comes back, it can collisionally excite the molecule or even go up and ionize it or excite it to a set of states. So we want to simplify the problem even further. So we'll set the laser intensity relatively low, so the only thing the electron has a chance to do is to collisionally excite the molecule to the sigma u. And so now we have only one state that can possibly be excited. And I'm going to concentrate now in those intensities, or what, which are 1.5 times 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter. I'll show you only once where we increase the intensity. And so then that's going to just have a simple physics that we can understand everything of. As I said, we've chosen the molecule perpendicular to the laser field. 
That's because perpendicular to the laser field, these two states are decoupled, and those are the two states that can be distorted by the field. Parallel, there are significant distortions to this caused by the field. Thirdly, a third reason for choosing the molecule perpendicular to the field is that the excited state is an asymmetric state, and an asymmetric state has a great deal of difficulty tunneling out. If you think about it, you've got a plus and minus wave function, and this plus my wa minus wave function has to sneak through the tunneling barrier, and it's just like a two-slit experiment where you've got two oppositely phased photons. They can't destructively interfere just where they've got to get through. And so it's really hard for this molecule to ionize, especially until it gets way out here. And so it's stable even against the field, which we keep low. And so again, it gives an extra protection against uh, problems. So now I want to be able to read the molecular clock. I showed you how we take the data, but we have to now be able to read, calculate the molecular clock. So what we do then to calculate the wave packet motion for the vibration, we take ionization from the ground state. I didn't expect to have to present it from this. That's why that's not fixed. I'm sorry. We ionize from the ground state wave packet to the H2 plus. The, there's a slight distortion of the wave function in the excited state relative to the ground state because the ionization potential is radially dependent, and therefore that affects the wave function. But it's not very much. It's a slight distortion. The wave packet then evolves in the gr on, the, uh, on the, s the ground state of the ion until the electron recollides and this excites the molecule to the H2 plus according to published cross sections. We use angle average cross sections because we don't know any other cross sections, but otherwise we correct them for radial dependence. We add, um, we predict the kinetic energy of the fragments and we each add each possible electron probability incoherently, not coherently, and we can discuss that later on if you wish. And we predict the recollision energy as a result. Let me just show you the time resolution that's implicit in this. So this is following that procedure, but artificially promoting after one femtosecond, two femtoseconds, three femtoseconds, four femtoseconds, the initial wave packet. In the first femtosecond, there's really not much motion, so essentially that's like it would be at zero femtoseconds. And you can see there's significant changes in the kinetic energy distribution on a femtosecond time scale. In other words, we have resolution for the electron dynamics on the one femtosecond time scale. We can argue if it's one or a little bit below or a little bit above. So here is the experimental results. These are early experimental results. I'm sorry again. Um, our results are much nicer now. But the conclusion is almost identically the same. So I plot here the experimental doubt results. Those are clear in the uh, experimental data with the error bars on, the error bars from standard deviation of the number of counts. The, the red curve and the maroon curve, or the, orange, or the uh, purple curve, are for the first recollision and the third recollision. They're simply samples to show you how they fit under. The blue curve is the sum of all recollisions as we calculate from the current density that I showed you in the first part, except for one thing, and that is we've adjusted the intensity of the signal. But the relative time structure of the signal is completely as we calculate it. There's only one free parameter, and that's the total intensity in the signal. And so you can see that we get it very well. As a matter of fact, with later data, we get it even better than it looks like there because the error bars are much lower. So we can measure the wave packet. We can measure this electron motion, and we can measure its time structure to a reasonable accuracy and it's clearly a decaying function, much like I showed you before, showed you earlier. As a matter, I've said that the, um, I don't know if I've got this part in or not. Yes, I do. I've said that we use one free parameter, and that was the intensity. But in a sense, it's not free. I simply chose it as a free parameter there. But we actually know what the current density was. I put a real number on the curve. 
And we know we can calculate what the, we can do from a calculation, we can do from an experiment, the probability of double ionization. And we can do a calculation of what should be the probability of double ionization. And so then I'll show you that. The first thing we have to be sure in order to allocate the vertical axis is, well, we've used angle average cross sections, and we don't know what they should be directional. So let's take an angle average measurement. And so this is the only case now where I vary my laser polarization with respect to the internuclear axis. This is the number of protons as a function of the angle between the laser polarization and the internuclear axis. So you can see that the double ionization process, the double ionization process is angle dependent. It's more likely for a molecule aligned to the field than a molecule aligned perpendicular to the field by a factor of on the order of 10 to 1, something like that. We don't know if that's the ionization process or if it's a cross-section. I personally think it's a cross-section, but it could be either. The experiment does not distinguish, or it may be a combination of both. But that gives us enough, enough information now to, do as, to calculate what is the total, so, so we know what each angle has, what's the total cross-section. And so now I'll show you the branching ratios that we measure and we measure them at a range of intensity. So this is the only time we varied from an intensity of 1.5 times 10 to the 14 in any data I've shown you. So let me just pro point out the energetic fragments which come from recollision. And that's this part down here. The others are uh, very low energy or intermediate energy fragments which come from those who are specialized in this field from enhanced ionization. If you're not, I didn't introduce you to the to the issues. These are the really low energy fragments which come from bond softening, and these are the H2 plus that survives to all intensities. You can see the probability of double ionization is approximately 3%. As with helium, it's approximately constant. And at, compared to helium, it's roughly an order of magnitude more probable to see double ionization than it is in helium. So since we've just heard data from helium, it's interesting to see the connection. Um, unfortunately, I didn't bring the ellipticity dependence, but let, or I do, do, but it's on my computer. But let me just tell you what the ellipticity dependence is. The ellipticity dependence of hydrogen we compared to argon, and argon's very much like hydrogen in its ionization potential and so on. Argon ellipticity dependence is as you calculate it from tunneling models. So it comes up, it's really a nice Gaussian, and its half width is about, I can't remember, 1.15 in ellipticity, something like that. And it falls off like in Gaussian rather fast. Hydrogen is slightly narrower, slightly more, or slightly sharper in its dependence on the ellipticity dependence, ellipticity. But interestingly, there's a slight difference for when the molecule is aligned with the laser polarization and when it's aligned perpendicular to the laser polarization. It's not a lot but it's a noticeable and measurable difference. And so there is an angular or alignment effect, and I don't know that anybody has thought about it. So if I get my computer going later and anybody wants to see it, I'll show you. Now, I don't know what my time is. I'm getting close to being done. Six minutes. Six minutes. Oh, well, six minutes. I got a lot of time. So now I want to just sort of restate this problem a little bit. And what we've managed to do is measure at a second resolution or femtosecond resolution electron dynamics, but we've used a 50 femtosecond pulse. I didn't emphasize it to you, but I did use a 50 femtosecond pulse to do this measurement. So how did we manage to make a measurement with at a second or femtosecond resolution and have such a long pulse? Well, the way we got around it was to use correlation. Or actually, in really in a deep sense, we use entanglement, but it's really in an unusual way. It's, uh, if we didn't have entanglement, we'd have modulation in our spectrum, and we can talk about that in the question period if you like. So can we use this correlation in a deeper or in another way? And so I'd like to go back now and begin the process. I think it's general. I think you can use correlation in lots of dynamics measurements. Um, and so I want to show you within this context of using it to watch the wave packet move but now change the vibrational wave packet. So again, I'd like to restate what I did in the first place. What we did is we ionized hydrogen 
launching correlated wave packets. And in the context of pump probe or femtosecond spectroscopy, that's like the pump stage in a pump probe experiment. The electron goes off in its trajectory, and that trajectory gives a delay, and that delay is controlled by the field. That's the delay stage in the pump probe spectroscopy. Usually, optically, we delay it in, a, in some delay stage. But I'm equally delaying this electron by taking the field and pulling it out and driving it back again. And then finally, when the electron returns and collides, that's like the probe stage in pump probe spectroscopy. And so in these kind of recollision experiments where you control one of the fragments relative to the other, only control one with respect to the other, you can find a direct an analog to pump probe spectroscopy. Actually, using correlated fragments is even more general than that. If you control both, you don't even need to find the analog. There are completely different ways to do pump probe spectroscopy that will probably allow you to push down to much shorter pulse durations. But I want to stick with this so for the remainder of my talk for the remaining few minutes. So let's go back and do the experiment again. Pump, let the wave packet evolve, probe. But now what I'll do is I'll change the time between my pump and my probe. And I'll use the electron as the probe. And since the first recollision dominates, I'm going to say, I think I can identify the first recollision against all others. Actually, remember in the curve, it dominated in a way. So let's use it. Let's change the wavelength. And let's watch the H2 plus move. So here's the sequence of data taken for different wavelengths of light. 800 nanometers, 12, 15, and 1850. 800 nanometers made by a tie sapphire and the remainder from an optical parametric amplifier pup by the same tie sapphire. So again, I argue that we should be able to identify in general principles a set of curves, a set of peaks. The first recollision Exciting from, sigma, from the ground state, the sigma u has the largest cross-section of everything. And so we should be able to identify it. It should be energetic. And there it is. And we identify those in purple, or in purple circles or purple data points just in general principles. There's no fitting involved in this at all. You see them all in all of these curves. And they sort of stick out. This is a very noisy one. 1800 is kind of bad. The wave function's expanded. And it's not so easy um, from an optical point of view as well. Of course, as I change the wavelength, the electron energy also increases. The electron now has enough energy to excite right up to the double ion. And we see that that's the most energetic of all, the first recollision to the double ion. But it's only one-sided, so I show you, but we won't use it to fit. And so those are the ones identified in red. So having identified the curves from an experimental point of view, no theory involved in it at all. We take those, that experimental data, and we project it onto the sigma u, project it down to r, and that's a measurement of the wave function structure on the ground state. And the only correction we apply is the radial dependence of the cross section. We fit that to a Gaussian for the wave function, and then project it back. And these curves that you see, the solid lines in purple, are for that. So again, they're experimental fits. There's no input into it whatsoever. And we establish the peak of that. And that's going to be the position of the wave function that we'll plot. And we'll plot it against time, which is the centroid of the first recollision. The only one on this curve that's not done that way, and so I want to comment on it, this one is fit from theory because you can see the data is kind of noisy and it's kind of difficult to fit it well. And so we decided we would show you how it would look from the calculations going forward rather than from the experiment going back. But the data points in the curve are from a fit from experiment only. This is the nuclear wave function. Sorry, this is a nuclear wave function probed by the electron. And this is bas basically the f structure, a measurement of that nuclear wave function. So this is the position of the wave function taken from the centroid of that Gaussian. Plot it as a function of time, time taken at the centroid of the first recollision. So this is the position in R, the internuclear separation. You can see the error bars are very good now at 800 nanometers. We can improve them tremendously at other wavelengths as well. 
Our accuracy is probably a small fraction of an angstrom in position. And, well, it depends what you mean by the accuracy, but you can see how well we fit the curve. We do very well, except for the very noisy point at 1.8. So basically, we watch the wave packet move by using the recollision physics. Now, I think I'm out of time, and I want to end then with just a comment on where I think this is important. I think it's important in many cases. So I think for many, many areas of optical physics, this is important. So from at a second physics, in some sense, that's how I introduced it. From an at a second point of view, electron bunches, it seems to me, will gain equal footing with, in at a second physics with optical pulses. As a matter of fact, they might do much better, because if you think about it, to produce at a second pulses, as I said in the introduction, is difficult. You must catch them and refocus them down, which you do badly, where they interact weakly with matter in order to do an experiment. The electrons are produced efficiently exactly where and when you want them, and there's no delivery problem. And so, for many cases, I doubt that um, optical pulses will be as useful as the electrons, and maybe the things we're learning through, thinking these things through. In femtosecond science, I think in some ways this is more important. So, in other words, we can forget the time resolution, but there's something else we gained. What did you do by taking the electrons and transferring them from the photons? Well, we took a particle with a wavelength on the order of an angstrom or a fraction of an angstrom, and we converted it by this optical process into a photon whose wavelength was 100 angstroms or 150 angstroms. I'm not sure it was a good trade-off. A photon or an electron whose wavelength is an angstrom will diffract from the molecule, telling you the structure of the molecule. And so from femtosecond science, which has really had no convenient short wavelength source, they do exist in synchrotron short wavelength sources, and people are trying to modulate them, and they do exist in electrons formed externally, and people are trying to keep them short and bring them in to do diffraction. But here they happen naturally. They are actually almost slave to the laser field. The electron is driven back with such precision that it's like slave to the laser field. I've shown you how you can use an inelastic scattering, but of course it's much more powerful if we use it with elastic scattering because elastic scattering is diffraction from a complex molecule. Finally, um, well, I think there are many other implications, and I made this view graph up for a talk on X-ray diffraction and the ideas of the fourth generation light source, and it seemed to me at that time, and it seems to me still, that the four, the um, single molecule imaging is such an important goal that it will probably, in my view, justify the fourth generation light source. This idea of getting just hugely intense x-rays to do single molecule imaging. And, well, I don't think I can compete with that, but the electron currents here are so large, the probability of recollision is so high, that at least we can help lead the way towards it, because this is not such an improbable event. And so maybe you call it few molecule imaging. I'm sure we won't get single molecule imaging like you can get from that. And so I think that's the third implication. And